storage team. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about bio-optimization on the ALCF file systems. As we know, nothing's done individually. And so I've got contributors to this as well. Uh, Kevin and Alex and Jack have assisted in contribution and review. I'll start with a high level overview of Theta. You guys probably know most of all of this. I won't spend a lot of time on here. Uh, but what I will talk about is the storage side of this. And so what we see here in this cartoon is that the compute nodes all connect to the Dragonfly network. Oh, whoops, I don't know how to turn that off, but I'll deal with it. Um, all the compute nodes talk to the Dragonfly network, which in turn, via that red node, which is in this case is an LNet node, which is a Lustre network node, a Luster network node is, is a node that has both uh, an Aries connection to talk to the Dragonfly network, as well as an InfiniBand connection to talk to the outside network where the Luster file systems live. And so basically the LNet node performs that, that translation, if you'd like, between the two networks. <laughs> there's not a single red node, but there's a, there's a, there's a number of, of when I start talking more about the other file systems besides just the one that's on this cartoon right now, uh, we'll be talking about the way the LNet nodes are also uh, distributed across the file systems. So the interesting thing here is that this is a 10 petabyte. Uh, this, this particular slide is talking to the Theta FS0 um, uh, file system on, on Theta. Also, it's known as slash projects. Slash projects is a symbolic link that points to slash lus slash theta fs zero slash projects. Uh, anyone can interrupt me and ask a question that they'd like. It's not uh, gonna throw me off. I'll talk a little bit about Lustre terminology. So there's a client the client runs on a compute node, runs on a login node, runs on DTN nodes for data transfer. Uh, basically, the client is the interface from, a, from an end user or an application code into the Lustre file system. Uh, we talked a second ago about the LNet, the Lustre network routers, IO forwarding. Uh, the way the file system in Lustre is actually laid out, it's divided across two separate services. Uh, one's called the object storage server, and that in turn has object storage targets. And the metadata servers in turn have metadata targets. Uh, the, the Theta FS0 file system and the two new file systems I'll introduce on the next slide, I believe, called Eagle and Grand, are the same sort of architecture. The difference being, well, A, the size of the file systems, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but also the in the MDT area, which is the target for metadata, the target for metadata in Theta FS0 is a RAID 10 of 10K RPM drives. So these are still spinning drives. And so they have the same latency characteristics of any other spinning drive for metadata transfer. Now the 10K RPM is faster than the OST, the, the object storage targets are where the bulk data associated to the file system is held. And on Theta FS0, and similarly on Eagle and Grand, these are all 7,200 RPM uh, SAS drives. Now the difference between this particular file system, Theta FS0 and Lust and Grand and Eagle are that the metadata targets on Grand and Eagle being a newer file system are, are flash-based, they're NVMe-based. And so they don't suffer the same sorts of uh, latencies, rotational delays as a rotating disk does, and they're much faster. And so when a file lands, this last statement at the bottom is talking about when a file lands on disk, it lands on one or more object storage targets. And we'll get into one or more in a slide or two. Okay, we're gonna talk about the first two file systems on this page are the, on the left-hand side is the Theta 
FS0 file system, also known as slash projects. Uh, this is running Lustre 2.12. Now it's kind of funny to talk about Lustre in terms of versions because our Lustre is actually provided by HPE. And what HPE does is looks at the upstream versions of Luster. And so if you look at the upstream versions, we're up to 214 now has been GA'd or generally announced as available. What HPE will do is look at the bugs that are in Luster and it will pluck or pick from the upstream versions some of the bugs that are required or needed to keep an operational environment operational. And what this does is it, it puts our version numbering into a slightly different light. It's not a pure Lustre 212. It's more of a Lustre 212 with quite a few fixes from 213 and 214 that have been included for stability. But it saves us from having to jump all the way to 213 or 214 when they're first announced and suffering the instability that you get with a brand new version of a file system at times. Um, the hardware here is 10 petabytes of usable RAID storage. That's divided up across 56 object storage, object storage servers. And on this particular file system, each of the object storage servers is serving its own OSS or its own OST, I'm sorry. Uh, these OSTs in this case are um, a declustered RAID technology. Um, this allows, this is, this is different than a RAID 5 or a RAID 6. The major difference in a declustered RAID array versus a regular RAID array is that the, the rebuild times are greatly enhanced or greatly shortened, which in turn puts data at risk for a much shorter period of time when there has been a hardware failure of a drive. The performance, um, and, and note the brackets when new. And so I'll speak to the performance when it was new, and I can speak somewhat to the performance now that it's not new. It's now uh, almost five years old. So the performance when it was new was approximately 172 gigabytes per second on the right side and 240 on the read side. Uh, the peak performance of a single OST was on the order of six gigabytes per second. And the last statement, the second to last statement is speaking to the Lustre client cache effects. And so if you are reading and then rereading data uh, on a client, there's a good chance that on the reread, again, depending on the, the size of the data being read and reread, it may actually be in the client cache. And that could have give you what would appear to be a higher bandwidth. On a single client, single thread, you have an expectation something like a gigabyte per second. And this will vary slightly by uh, some of the IO characteristics of block size and that sort of thing. Now, again, going back to the statement of when new, and so we know we're no longer new. This particular file system is somewhat challenged at the, at the minute we speak. It's about 86% um, occupied. Um, and Lustre file systems exhibit slowdown characteristics when they start to get towards full. And so this file system right now would be in that category of being towards full. And so we don't see 240 gigabytes per second any longer on this particular file system. We're seeing numbers that are closer to 100 to 120 or so. And that will vary again by some of the properties we'll talk about in a few minutes. On the right hand side, we have just, just sorry, just a question about the RAID system. Just out of curiosity, what kind of RAID do you have on that? So the RAID is it's uh, it's running uh, MD ADM, the standard kind of Linux RAID, but the difference is is that it runs a different RAID module. So instead of being a RAID five or a RAID six, it's called it's called D RAID, and in this case, it's a forty one drive in a in a RAID group. And then within the 41 drives, we then carve out. Uh, it's, it's kind of complicated and hard to describe without drawing on a whiteboard, but we carve out of the 41 drives, we carve out RAID 6s. And so an individual RAID 6 has a similar characteristics that it can allow for two physical drive failures. But in a distributed, distributed RAID, there is no affinity now any longer 
between extents and a physical device. Uh, it, the, all the extents in all the 41 drives are put into a common pool. And then that pool is then in turn subdivided to get these smaller RAID entities. Uh, like I say, it's fairly complicated to look at, but you're gonna be seeing this a lot more going forward. The, the, the rebuild characteristics alone uh, are calling for it. The, the drives here are, I believe these are six terabyte drives in this particular file system. When we start talking about Eagle and Grand, we're have, gonna have moved to a 16 terabyte drive. The issue is, is that in a regular RAID 5 or a RAID 6, when a single drive fails, what happens then is that drive gets replaced and then data is copied. It's not quite as I'm saying, but it's just a simplified approach to it. But data is copied or reconstructed back onto that single drive. And so what limits the rebuild time in this kind of a RAID system is the performance of that single drive. How fast can I shove data into that single drive divided by you know, the size of that drive basically calculates the rebuild time. And so in industry-wide, the recognition was made many years ago that with drive capacities increasing, that the exposure to drive failures during rebuild is getting, was increasing. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that when you have a drive failure in a RAID array, that RAID array might have been um, being used lazily. All of a, you know, it's this maybe it's not being accessed very frequently, but nevertheless, a drive has failed. When you're doing a drive rebuild, all the drives get hammered really hard. And so, what the industry has also seen is that sometimes during a RAID rebuild, because now you're putting extra load on the actual drives in the RAID array, you suffer a second drive failure. And so this is one of the what reasons that RAID 5 is more, RAID 6, I'm sorry, is more favored than RAID 5, because you then can, you can suffer that second drive failure, but again, not lose any data. Now in a declustered RAID array, the way it works is that there is no concept of a, of a real spare drive in terms of a physical drive. But when a spare drive is inserted, the extents that are on that spare drive are distributed across all the other 40 drives for a total of 41. And so now you can think about a big pool of extents and some of those extents are spare. They're not being used at this moment. Now, if a physical drive fails, the, the arrangement of RAID array is always to never to have any data that's unique to that drive that would be lost on upon a failure. And so a drive failure by its nature means that the data is all available somewhere else. And when it comes time to rebuild, rather than having a gate of a single drive, again, going back to the capacity of the RAID array being trying to be written into that single drive, you're now using all 41 drives to participate in the RAID rebuild. And so that by its nature uh, speeds the performance up significantly. Does, does that help somewhat with the question? Absolutely. Very interesting. Uh, so essentially, how much is the overhead of just having that pool uh, comparing with the, the total capacity? It, it's not much. It's not much overhead as compared to a normal RAID 5 or a RAID 6. Because you're already, doing, yeah, you're already doing the remapping to begin with in a yeah. RAID 5, RAID 6 environment. So you're not really paying an extra tax, if you like the word or not, <laughs> um, to do- Thanks for uh, all the details. Thank you, yeah, that, that was good. Be RAID array. If you look on the internet, you're gonna find um, quite a bit of information on declustered RAID arrays. Uh, we use a similar technology and we have an ESS box, an IBM GPFS ESS box, and it uses a, a distributed RAID technology as well that was developed by IBM many years ago uh, when I used to work for that team. Uh, and that was developed for the, for the ill-fated Blue Waters project. And, um, but I can talk further about that, but maybe we could get to the end of the slides. And if there's still questions, we can come back to this topic, if that sounds okay. Yeah, yep, that's perfect with me, thank you. Okay. Okay, on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm gonna talk about the current home file system. And I use the word current because we're in transition. And you may not be aware of that transition, but I'll share some of that with you today. So 
basically the, the home file system is not a Lustre file system, it's a GPFS file system. Uh, GPFS is also known as Spectrum Scale uh, from IBM. On the, on the login nodes, we don't mount GPFS directly on a, on a, sorry, on a compute node. We don't mount GPFS directly. We access it via an IO forwarding technology called the Data Virtualization Service, the DVS acronym they're looking at now. What we have is we have a series of nodes similar to LNet nodes in the sense that they're on one side of the interface or on the ARIES network and the other side of the interface are on the InfiniBand network. So they act very much in the same way as that LNet node acts. But in this case, we run a GPFS client on that node and it in turn accesses the GPFS file system via an InfiniBand network. Now, rather than having a GPFS client that then in turn delivers that data to a compute node, that's where the DVS layer comes in. And so the DVS layer is an IO forwarding layer. You can think about it as an interception layer. And so all the POSIX calls that get issued by that compute node get intercepted by DVS and they get forwarded to a GPFS node that in turn does the IO and then returns it back to DVS again. That's probably a little bit confusing, but um, that's the way the current home system is mounted to the compute nodes on Theta. Now the login nodes on Theta don't exploit the DVS technology. They don't have an ARIES network that needs to be transitioned. And so therefore on the, on the login nodes on Theta, that's a, G, a native GPFS client. Now to you, it makes, to the normal user, it makes no real practical difference. Um, this, but I am just pointing out what, what is in fact in the, in the, in the system here for you. Uh, the hardware is a petabyte of usable RAID storage. This is probably our most over-configured uh, file system in the shop. Uh, it came in with one petabyte of usable storage. Our home occupancy is on the order of 70 terabytes. So you can see it's a very small fraction of usable storage. Um, now the home file system is not, is not performant on heavy IO. And so I don't know if any of you guys have ever been a recipient of one of my, one of my hello notes, that would be, hello, you're misusing Mira Home. <laughs> um, but it's not really designed as a project file system. It doesn't have nearly the same amount of resource for serving IO as a project file system. Uh, and therefore we don't like to use the home file systems for you know, recipients of large workloads. They're fine for loading binaries or large, they're, they're fine for that sort of usage, but, but the project file systems in our, in our Lustre file systems are much more geared for supporting large IO workloads. Now I'll talk for a minute about the transition I mentioned. So GPFS Mira Home was brought in by its name, as you can see, brought in in the Mira timeframe. And it's now rather aged and we're looking to replace it. We had planned to replace uh, the current Mira home with another GPFS file system, but we got that plan got, um, got shot down just recently. Um, we're going through and preparing for the Polaris system that you guys may know somewhat about, at least on the name basis. Um, and one of the differences between the Polaris systems and the Theta system is that the Polaris system is not going to be offering us this DVS service. And so what would have, we would have needed to do is to needed to mount GPFS onto each individual node. And uh, we decided against that. And so what we're doing right now is that we've just finished on the last PM window, we just finished doing stress testing on another new Lustre file system that will be our Lustre home file system. Now, it doesn't really matter to most people whether it's Lustre or GPFS. One of the big differences here is that this particular home file system is gonna be based completely on NVMe flash. And so no longer will we have any rotational delays or any latency associated with disk devices in our home file system. The hope is this should significantly speed up things like compiles and builds and that sort of thing on the login nodes. Any questions on that? 
Okay, I'll go into the next two file systems. And these are new file systems that we just finished installing. Uh, they were delivered the middle of last year. And we brought them in line just in late December in time for Insight to start in January of this year. These are two file systems called Grand and Eagle. We're going after canyons <laughs> as repository for large amounts of something, in this case, data. Uh, Luster 2.12, the same versions of Luster we talked about earlier with the same uh, words wrapped around it, that it's not purely Luster 2.12, it's Luster 2.12 with a lot of fixes for a lot of problems that we discovered during our acceptance testing of these two file systems. Now, these file systems are significantly larger than Theta FS0. Uh, they're 100 petabytes in size of usable RAID storage each. And so for a total of 200 petabytes, and then the next two numbers are similar to the, just going back to our architecture statement that we looked at earlier on Theta FS0, where we have 40 OSSs. Now in this case, each OSS owns four OSTs. Okay, if you remember back, we talked about Theta FS0 where each OSS, each object storage server owned a single target. And so in this case, each object storage server is responsible to serve four targets. These targets, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, are based on 16 terabyte uh, HDD. Now what's new or what's, you know, the, the, the faster part of this particular file system is that it's got 20 metadata servers and each metadata server has two targets and these are NVMe targets. So this, the, the create rates are significantly faster on these two file systems than any create rate we'd seen on Theta FS0. In fact, we measured greater than 1 million creates per second during our acceptance testing on this particular file system. And so the performance here is observed 650, 650. These were the acceptance test numbers that need to be met by requirements from the vendor. We in fact observed numbers that were higher than this. And so we saw numbers on the on the read side approaching 800 gigabytes per second. So again, we'll go back and guarantee these, the numbers you're seeing on the slides, but you may well observe higher performance numbers. Now I am gonna speak a little bit about the performance on both the slide earlier, but especially the slide now. The performance that's quoted here is a performance that we will eventually achieve. Let me describe that. So right now we're in transition across a number of things. I talked about the home file system. Another area that we're also in transition on is our InfiniBand network. So we've just installed a brand new HDR, which is a 200 gigabit per second network. The Theta file, these two new file systems live on that, on that network. Theta FS0 lives on an, on a, on an FDR, no, an EDR network which is significantly slower than 200 gigabits per second. In order to have these networks all talk to each other, there needed to be, and, and this is not the right networking terminology I'm gonna use, but it's a terminology that makes our life simpler, but there needed to be some bridging between these networks. Now the bridging that's currently in place is limiting our performance from theta compute nodes to both Eagle and Grand to a, some, to a number somewhere close to the numbers I described earlier on Theta FS zero's performance currently. So somewhere close to the 70 to 80 gigabytes per second, perhaps a hundred. These limits will be lifted when the Mira file systems that we've just finished taking away from users on the last PM window, when they're finally decommissioned, which is in progress now, then we're gonna be able to sunset the oldest of our InfiniBand networks, which in turn is going to be allowed, allow us to take advantage of the performance of the newer networks. Uh, I'm sorry if this is confusing and I don't have a slide for it, but I, did, I didn't want to leave you with a distinct impression that this is the numbers you can achieve today on Theta. But these will be the numbers you'll be able to achieve at some point on Theta. And certainly on systems that we're installing going forward, they'll be installed natively on the HDR IB network. Uh, 
or their LNET routers will have access to the HDR IB network and they won't suffer from this performance penalty that we currently have in place. Is that clear as mud or have I confused everyone? Okay. Uh, this, this slide just talks to one of our common questions that people ask, and that is how do I know if I'm with or within my quota? And so the my projects quota command, and this is simply a sample output using me as the guinea pig. It shows us down the right hand side, the project that's, that's in the file system. And it shows us the, the file system that we're within, the used quota and what the quota is set to and the grace period. For anyone who's not familiar with the way grace periods work, we have two quota settings on a file system. One's called the soft quota and one's called the hard quota. When you exceed your soft quota, if you use, if you use me as the guinea pig here and look at the first line of acceptance in the Theta FS0 file system, you'll see that set to a quota of 100 terabytes. That's the soft quota. As a rule, what we do is we set the hard quota to 10%. So 110% of 100 is 110 terabytes. So the way soft and hard works is that when you exceed your soft quota, you can still write to the file system. You're, we're still, the file system will still allow allocation requests for new space to happen. However, you're gonna start a grace period timer that's gonna be counting down from I believe it's nine days to zero. When you reach zero, if you're still over soft quota, you'll now be disallowed new allocations. And so the grace period is this what it sounds like. It's a grace period to allow you to reduce your quota below soft quota. As soon as you reduce your quota below soft quota, your grace period immediately resets. And you, you could effectively play a game with us that you could reduce below soft and have another nine days of living within that 10% grace period. It's not a game anyone wants to play, but I'm explaining the mechanical part of it here. Uh, the, other, the other quota called the hard quota is just what it sounds like. Any requests beyond hard quota are denied. You're not allowed allocations beyond hard quota. And these all show up and I'm sure air messages that people are familiar with, uh, E quota, space denied, messages to that effect. That all pretty clear? <laughs> okay, we'll talk about some IO models. And so the very basic model of IO performance or IO is the POSIX IO interfaces, the standard API fully supported by both GPFS and Lustre. And it's really the lowest level API for the, for the IO subsystem. More familiar with you, I'm sure, are gonna be libraries that run on top of the POSIX interfaces, things like MPI IO, uh, where you can do both independent and collective IO, and I'm not going to go in deep into MPI. I'm going to make some assumptions that this crowd is fairly knowledgeable on, on MPI. Is that a fair statement to make? Okay. And Cray also offers other libraries or other uh, for, for IO libraries, HDF5, NetCDF. And so we strongly recommend the use of high level IO libraries both for portability, as well as there's been a lot of work, intellectual work gone into these IO libraries in order to provide good out of the box performance. Talk a little bit about files. Um, so files per process, basically this scales well. Um, you could do, you know, the example here is 10,000 files. Um, the system works fairly well with default settings for file per process. You can run into problems if you have file per process and you have a lot of processes that if you're all doing an open or a create, uh, you're gonna be hammering the metadata server. And that's what that last statement talks about. Uh, another approach would be to use a single, a single shared file. Uh, and so in the single shared file, there could be, there could be some lot contention. A lot of IO libraries will do a lot of work to prevent these kinds of contentions on lock, on locking. Um, 
the server side here does not do any read or any read caching, and the server side also does not do any write caching. And so that's both by design and by design of Luster itself it could be done, but it's not a very mature part of the product. Could add some risk. Uh, we don't recommend any particular approach, but but last evening when I was thinking about presenting this again to you, I thought I could offer some advice here. So one of the pieces of advice, actually, I'm going to come back to this advice in another slide or two when we talk about striping, but I won't lose track of that. A optimization of IO. So the keys to performance here are to use as much of the machine as possible. And this is nothing new to this crowd uh, being in parallel performance and parallel computing. So the very same app, the very same ideas apply to IO. So in other words, the example here, the cartoon here is showing writing a single eight megabyte file. It's showing uh, various stripe counts. And so what's showing here is that the stripe count equals one is going to write a one one megabyte stripe and it's going to write it on a single OST. Now a stripe count of four is going to say I want to take the same, in this case, eight blocks of data and I want to stripe it across four OSTs. And you can see that in the cartoon by the, by the colors changing across the OSTs. And so in this case, you've gotten more parallelism by using more underlying disk devices. Again, remembering that each of these OSTs is actually in turn in theta FS0, 41 hard drives, okay? Now, again, the next example, this shows the natural evolution of the stripe count increasing and now it's sitting at eight. And so now we've written all the eight stripes across eight separate OSTs. The defaults in our file systems is a single OST. In other words, the default stripe count is one and the default stripe width is a one megabyte stripe. And so if you do nothing, you'll get one megabyte stripes across a single OST. Now, in many cases, that's a good I.O. pattern. Depends on the nature of the primarily the size of the file that you're writing out. But I'll also talk a little bit about intersection. So some notes about striping. Uh, files and directories inherit the striping patterns from their parent directory. What this means is that you can set the striping pattern in a parent directory and the files that then get created during your, your compute run will inherit the striping characteristics of that same directory. Uh, talked about, I talked about the default striping. There's also another option that allows you to get creative and set the stripe offset. In other words, where in these 56 OSTs do I wanna start my round robin or my, my striping? Uh, we recommend that you don't play with this. This simply allow Luster to choose where it's going to start that striping. And it's got algorithms that it likes to run in order to pick a good starting point for the striping to begin with. Uh, the, stripe can't, the stripe count can't exceed the number of available OSTs. And so the number of available OSTs on theta FS0 was, was 60. And that was, again, 56 nodes, each with a single OST. And on Eagle and Grand, it was 40 OSSs or 40 object storage servers, each serving four OSTs for a total of 160 OSTs. The stripe count equals negative one is a magic symbol that says to go ahead and use all the available OSTs without you having to actually hard code a number. And so that way, if, for example, if an OST happened to be offline, which is not a natural thing or not a good thing, but your job is still write to the available OSTs using minus one. Well, if you had asked for 56 explicitly and only 55 are available, then Luster would fail that request. Uh, striping cannot be changed once a file is created. In order to recreate a file, you need to copy it to a new directory. That probably makes sense. Uh, some suggestions to you. Um, file per process, uh, use a default striping. What this does is, I'll talk about I'll talk about what it does in a second. The shared file, we'd recommend that um, you could use up to forty eight OSTs uh, at files greater than greater than a gigabyte. 
and we really recommend doing a little bit of experimentation. But I will talk about some of the, the pitfalls here. So for example, if you were to run a file per process and then and write it into a directory, and that directory had Stripe set to 48 OSTs, for example, well, you're probably not going to get very good performance because what's now happening is that every process is now trying to stripe across all 48 OSTs. And if you had, for example, a 4,000 node job, you've now got 4,000 nodes that are trying to access all 48 OSTs all at the same time. And so there's going to be a lot of contention. In that case, in a file per process case, you're much better off to use a single stripe count and write a single megabyte to an OST. And that way, what happens is the 4,000 compute nodes get divided across the 48 OSTs. And you can see pretty quickly that the amount of traffic to an individual OST has gone down significantly. Does, does that make sense to people? Or have I generated any questions? Okay, I'll show you some examples of some of these commands to set the striping and to check on the striping. And so as the default says, it's not necessarily optimal for large files. In large files, you probably want to stripe it across more than one OST. And so in this case, what we've done is we've made a directory uh, called stripe count four, size of eight megabytes. And then we use an LFS command, a Lustre file system command called set stripe. And we use the minus C parameter for the stripe count and the minus S parameter for the stripe size. And then the operand is the, the, the directory you want to change that property on. The next command, the get stripe command, simply returns to you what is the striping set to in this particular directory. And so if you were to run LFS get stripe against a directory that you just simply created and the parent directory didn't have any settings set, it would return stripe count one and the stripe size would be one megabyte. And the stripe offset would be minus one to allow Lustre to pick. <laughs> now, here's an example of, of a stripe a file that actually has, um, I'm gonna use the word content, but you're gonna quickly see it doesn't actually have content per se, but it definitely occupies space. This is an interesting concept. So we've, we CD to the directory we created on the last slide that we knew has a stripe count of four and a stripe, count, a stripe size of eight megabytes, and we touched the file. And then we ran a, a, a get stripe against this directory. And because there's only two files in this directory, it returns the, the get stripe the same way it returned if you interrogated get stripe against that individual file. And it's telling us the stripe count is four, the stripe size is eight megabytes. There's some things that we don't really need to care about. Uh, including the offset, but now the next four lines under the object ID and the, uh, the the object index ID and the object ID, now we see that the touch command, even though it didn't actually write data into that file, it's gone off and allocated a stripe. And so now, if you were to look at your quota, you'd be occupying 32 gigabytes or 32 megabytes, I'm sorry, of space on that particular file. So this example not only points out how LFS get stripe works, but it also points out the potential danger of writing a series of very small files into a directory that has a has stripe that has the stripe settings modified from the default. Uh, and for example, if you had a directory that was sitting at one megabyte times 48 OSTs, this LFS get stripe for the touch would actually show that 48 extents have been allocated to that particular file. So is it like I tried to type that command while you were presenting yep. the LFS get stripe dot uh, just on some directory that they had created, uh, but it gives me an error, for example. It says you cannot. Are you in a Lustre file system? I'm just on the home directory. I don't know. Which one. If, you're in, if you're in the home directory, then you're on a, a GPFS file system. Oh, there you go. And it won't recognize LFS commands. Okay, so we gotta be 
we got to log into that one, and then we are going to be able to access this. And the other option would be you use you use the dot, which said to use your current directory. You could have used LFS get strike with an absolute path, and that would have worked. Okay. But yeah, good question. Okay, I've talked a little bit about some of the IO optimizations in MPIIO. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but the hints are, again, the hints are, are striping unit. This goes back to the capital S in the set stripe command. And the striping factor is going back to the minus C in the stripe set, uh, the set stripe command, the LFS command. Talks about some of the collective optimizations that we can try and use or can be used. And this is all well documented in, in the MPI documentation. So here's some of the here's some cartoons about some of the performance numbers, and you can kind of see where the 48 number came from. I mentioned a couple of slides ago, as opposed to the 56 number, which is the capability. And so, at some point, for particular I/O workloads, you're going to likely hit a saturation point where simply having more OSTs isn't necessarily always going to be better. And so there could be some optimization that could be done on your own codes or on your own applications. But generally speaking, you know, the more OSTs, the more concurrency, the more parallelism, the higher the performance as a general rule. Are people familiar with Darshan? So Darshan is a tool that runs, it's loaded by, um, it's loaded by LD preload. And if you don't change your environment, and if you don't change your environment, then Darshan will profile your jobs as they run on Theta. It takes a small amount of memory and a small amount of overhead, but when your job finishes, you can interrogate or you can basically generate a report from the raw binary Darshan data that's been collected. And you can produce a report that shows a lot of detail about the IO characteristics of your particular job. Helps a lot to understand what the job's doing IO wise. One of the first places that we'll go look if we get reports of IO problems or IO slowdowns and that sort of thing on a particular application and not just system wide. And here's a sample of that sort of output. And so this is sampling a, an IOR run, which is a benchmarking tool. And it's showing you some of the breakdowns of where time is being spent in read or write or in seek or open. Some of the MPI variables for profiling. Some of the MPI, some of the Cray patterns for binary implementation. I'm not very familiar with this particular tool myself. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to the two luster or the three luster file systems, I'm sorry, and the home file system, there's also the capability to run load, node local on Theta. So each node on Theta, each compute node on Theta has 128 gigabyte SSD. Uh, the performance numbers are, are, are listed. These should be obtainable because I'm gonna to describe to you the way these are, are used. And so when a job starts on Theta, what's happened before your job has been granted nodes by the scheduler, by Cobalt in this case, is that the node itself has gone through a Cray process called node health check. And what node health check does is runs through the series of checks on a node after the previous job has ended to make sure that that node is still healthy, to make sure that job, the previous job, hasn't somehow damaged that node, left a stuck process or you know all kinds of things could potentially happen. One of the things that happens is that if there's any data from a previous run on that SSD, it'll get removed. 
And so this particular SSD, it, it's, it's, it's set up in a way that it's yours for the execution of a job, but you're also responsible then both because it's, it's empty when you first run your job. So it would be your responsibility that if you needed to put data on there to be accessed, to copy it on in your Cobalt job deck, and if you needed results to be saved, to copy it off of that node local storage uh, into, uh, into some other file system, for example, the, the project file system on Lustre. Um, this requires uh, an access to be granted. Basically what we do is we uh, join you or permit you into another Unix group. And that Unix group in turn has permission to this file system that's sitting on a node local storage. And there's a URL there for how do you request node local storage on Theta. And so this goes through more of the steps, attribute required in the Q sub command. It's mounted on slash local slash scratch. The data is deleted like I, speak, I spoke to. And, um, and they might be slower than Lustre, they might be outperform Lustre. And a lot of that depends on the actual IO workload. You know, if it's a series of very small IOs, you could probably benefit greatly from the local SSD. If it's a series of very large IOs to a large data set, you know, any benefit that the, the SSD may give you might be destroyed by the fact that you need to load the data into it first. And so, but again, this is very, it could be very unique to application codes. And so this, uh, this is available to people who want to experiment. And here's some of the numbers on performance. Nothing particularly revolutionary here. This is just a normal, you know, consumer grade kind of a, of a solid state disk. Nothing really special about the solid state disk either. And it is a solid state disk as opposed to an NVMe protocol flash drive. So this still suffers from, you know, the same SATA kernel limitations that solid state disks do on other platforms. And so that kind of summarizes uh, what I wanted to talk about today. But I did have a couple of other things I thought about last evening that I'm going to be adding to the ALCF uh, storage pages that you may or may not have seen. But a couple of them have to do with the numbers of files that we're starting to see in, in your projects. I'll give you a couple of examples, just as an illustration. If people who were here during the, the, the Mira days, we had a file system called Mira FS0. This is a GPFS file system. It was 19 petabytes in size. And the largest file count I ever saw while managing that file system was on the order of 1.4 billion objects in that order. Right now on Theta FS0, it's a 10 petabyte file system. So it's roughly half the size of, of FS0 on Mira, but it's got over 2 billion inodes at the moment. We had one particular very interesting project that highlighted this to me. We had one particular project that was using less than one terabyte of disk storage, but it had 155 million files in it. And so this is a vast difference than normally HPC places characterize their IO as large block, large IO. I mean, that's kind of what people have always thought. That hasn't been true for a long time. So that's not a, an accurate characterization. However, the last observation that we made, the 155 million files in a single one terabyte space is also not what we've been used to. So a couple of words that I'm gonna be adding to the ALCF storage pages and I'm gonna share with you now. If you know you're in a project that's gonna be generating this sort of uh, file counts, you know, these are very small files. These are on the order of kilobytes in size. If you know you're in a project that's going to be creating this many files, we would love to have a heads up from you all. All you need to do is drop an ALCF help ticket 
say something like I'm in project X, Y, Z. Uh, I know I'm gonna be creating hundreds of millions of files as part of this, the lifetime of this project. And these files will be small. When we see that sort of a, of a heads up, and especially if you don't have any data uh, in, your, in your directories yet, in your projects yet, we may well uh, take action in terms of either relocating you to a different file system that you're already in. Uh, and at a minimum, we're gonna take, we're gonna take actions to ensure that you not only have a large amount of space to grow metadata into, but also by the nature of your application codes now, by definition, it's much more metadata intensive. And so there's techniques that we can use on our side that can help with that intensity, even when I've said earlier that our metadata is now based on Flash. Uh, does, does that kind of heads up ring a bell or does, does that a, is that a familiar thing of people on the call running project with that sort of um, file counts or expect to at some point? Okay. I don't expect that from my side, but I, I recognize what you're saying, the advantages of, of having that. I, I suppose eventually it's actually even using less space if you can customize it, right? Because you are not gonna allocate the same kind of uh, blocks. Is that correct? Yeah, it could be. I mean, the allocations for metadata are slightly different than the allocations for, for space. Um, I'll give you one example in what we do is what we do is when we, when we format the Lustre file system, we actually pre-format all the inodes. Now they're empty, you know, they're, they're waiting for to be used. But what that does is when it comes time for a create to be, to be honored by the file system, it doesn't no, need to go and actually create an inode. It just needs to go use one of the existing inodes that already has been created by the format process. So that's one of the things that we do to, in order to optimize metadata performance. Uh, but more to the point, it's more that we would recognize that your project's gonna be very intensive and we would ensure that more than one metadata server is associated with your project space. And so in the same way that we parallelize IO across multiple OST targets, we would also be parallelizing the metadata traffic across multiple MDT targets and potentially across multiple metadata servers themselves. Does that, does that help the illustration a bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I also have a question related to how many inodes can we have in, in one directory right now? Yeah, that's a great question because that's exactly my next point. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've seen problems um, both with luster and performance. And so with Lustre, we have successfully, I've had projects put up to 10 million in a single directory, 10 million files in a single directory. This will not be a happy experience for you or for I. And so our recommendation is that you don't exceed maybe two or two and a half million files in a directory. And if you can do anything to limit that, that would be great. You know, subdivide it as, as frequently as you can. Uh, it, Having many, many, many inodes measured in the millions in a single directory, it causes all kinds of issues. I mean, if you want to find something, you know, it's now all of a sudden very hard. And, you know, LS commands become very long to run because there's so many objects in that particular directory. And then the challenge I had this recently with a project team was that they got themselves into this situation. They had to use a single directory to consolidate results over the course of time and had greater than 10 million inodes. And then they started actually having problems. And so there is, you're eventually gonna run into luster limitations. And this particular team ran into those limitations. And so the, the, the remediation was to go and do a lot of work on reorganizing data into subdirectories and moving data between that main directory into subdirectories. And as you can appreciate, a lot of the tools you'd normally use all of a sudden don't work so well when there's a million or 10 million files in a directory because it just simply chokes on that many, that many uh, durants. So we'd recommend a lower number 
you know, two, two and a half million will certainly be safe. You won't suffer performance problems at that level and they won't have any impact on overall file system performance for anybody else in our community. Uh, but you can best judge for yourself your ability to manage directories that have that high of a file count. But I'm not gonna, you know, we're not here to dictate how you manage your data, but that does go directly towards your question and thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Anything else oh, that I can? Well, what, one thing that I can see is that if you use the, the whole system, let's say you have uh, what, 281, over 281,000 cores, right? And then if you are doing the follow IO one file per core, just in one snapshot, uh, then you are gonna use this many, right? And yeah, now if right. you don't, don't organize them in directories, as the simulation goes, then it quickly fills up. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The core count. If you're having a file per core count, right? Then that's by default. You're gonna, like you said, you're gonna open, you know, two hundred eighty-one thousand files at the same time. So, yep, you need to manage that somehow. It'll work and work and work until it doesn't, and then it won't really impact us, but it will certainly impact your team, and so. The best is to avoid the, that potential and just upfront think about the data organization. Maybe you do uh, make your before you do your checkpoint, and you have a you know you do a, a check a granularity of a directory per checkpoint or something like that. But I, again, I'm not here to dictate how you run your application codes either. If you uh, if you guys have any uh, as you use our file systems. If you discover things that we haven't shared with you that you think would be useful to be shared with a broader audience, please uh, just feel free to write, uh, just write a help ticket to ALCF and just state what your concern is or your observation is and, and we'll get it on the storage team. And that's a fine way to communicate. You don't need to necessarily try and find me or find someone on the storage team to communicate with. Coming in with those kinds of, of questions or observations through the help channel is absolutely acceptable. And with that, if there's no other questions, I think I'm almost right at my time.